run the interpretive center, uh, at least through October and hopefully on into the future. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you down to the hatchery. At the hatchery right now, we've raised five species. Uh, rainbow trout or steelhead, Chinook salmon, northern pike, walleye, and muskie. We raise those every year and it kind of works out. We have something here year round. Um, also, occasionally we will raise lake sturgeon. We have 400 on site right now. I can't take you into that area, but we're, we're trying to work with them and, and reestablish the lake sturgeon. And also, if grayling are done, we do grayling here. We're the only site that uh, right now that are raising scaminian steelhead. So we have another variety of steelhead that I'll show you some of those when we get down there. Um, we do release those into the St. Joe River. The steelhead that we produce, they go all over the state. They even go to other states. We do trades with Indiana, Wisconsin, and they'll go all over, all over Michigan. So I'll take you down right now, and I want you to think about one thing on the way down. Well, actually, maybe three things. The three things that fish need to live. Fish need to live. And when we get down... What'd you come up with? Any uh, ideas? Water. They need water. Very good. Food. Water. They need food. Oxygen. Oxygen. That's the three things. They do need space, but we kind of push those the limits. This is what we have here. I'm going to cover those three things and how we keep fish alive. Right over there is our two wells. They pump about 4,000 gallons a minute. That's like filling up a swimming pool in less than a minute. Dumping it right in. Wow. That's under peak operation, 4,000 gallons per minute. It comes in at 51 Four degrees. Gallons. Optimum temperature for trout is 54 degrees. So we're real close with that, and we don't we do very little heating. The only time we do any heating of our water is when we're hatching hatching fish. That way we can control when they're going to hatch. What's the other one? Oxygen. We need some oxygen. Over there is our oxygen oxygen generation unit. That takes atmospheric air, sends it through a set of filters, and purifies it into pure oxygen. All the byproducts are released back into the atmosphere. You can hear that gas leaking out. That's everything coming back in that we don't need. Carbon and the other trace elements there. Um, our system is set up so that we can put oxygen into the water at any point. We'll use the water coming through there four times. It'll be used once in the, in the uh, tank room, three times in the raceway. Right now, this is a slow time of year for us. The only thing we have inside are rainbow trout or steelhead. Why, why am I saying rainbow trout or steelhead? What's the difference between? Well, they're the same fish, but what's the difference between a rainbow trout and a steelhead? Rainbow trout are the small and baby, or, uh, no? Well, you close, not quite. bigger. We raise steelhead that we release, release into the river system and that go out to Lake Michigan. So steelhead are, are, are spawner. Why is it that the rainfish put into the water right? and it settles off and we dredge that pond every year? One is you can't run because there's a lot of tanks and everything's cement. It's hard here. So you can't run. And don't put your hands in the water. That's rule number two. Why don't I want you to put your hands in the water here? They, they could have oil on, they're dirty, you can carry disease on there that could, could make our fish sick. And so we don't want to lose a bunch of fish. We have 1.8 million fish in there, and if you put something bad into the water from your hands, we're in a whole lot of trouble. Um, we'll head down this way. Did you hear that bang? That's our automatic fish feeder. And probably when you get up to look at a tank, it's going to smack right in front of you. Don't worry. We didn't do anything, it's just feeding the fish. They feed once every 10 minutes, so they go up quite a bit. We'll head up this way. The first tank I'm going to show you has Scamanian steelhead. They're about almost two months old at this point. They're two months old. They have been, we've had to slow down their growth rate to keep them with the other steelhead. They hatch about three weeks earlier. So we slow them down, but you will see a size difference. If you look at this, they're about two months. If you look at the tanks, we have baffles in there. 
That's not to keep the fish separated because they can go right underneath. What that does is concentrate the water flow down to the bottom. That way it takes up and wastes the food they don't eat and all the, the poop in there and puts it down to the end so it's easier to clean. Also, it uh, gives them two areas that they can go in, a fast current and also a resting area. So you'll see some like to sit down in the current, some don't. They try to keep them, the, you know, we would like it if the fish used all the space, but we find that they all like to congregate at one end. No matter what the fish, they'll all sit down at one end. And, and we tried some experiments with density. No matter what, they all just crowd up anyway. So they, they form their own density. We can go to two different tanks. Let's run through the tank, go through the system, and there's a standing pipe that it flows out. From here, if we're under full operation, it goes out to the, to the raceways. Right now, it just goes directly into the pond. If you slow the growth rate down, how do you do that? Growth is controlled by temperature and food. Okay, so, so if you lower the temperature a little bit and you decrease the food. Why, why, I miss why. Why do you so much? We plant them at the same time. So we try to keep them at the same. We try to plant at 8 inches, 8 to 10 inches. If they grow too fast, we're planting too big of a fish. So it's a little bit. These are Michigan steelhead. They're about a, a month five weeks old right now. These are the ones we have 1.8 million of. That's a good question. Actually what they do is they'll weigh the water, weigh the density of the fish, and we get an estimate. There's that one point and when we get a little farther along in the tour, I'll tell you when we actually count the fish. We collect the eggs from wild caught fish. We don't keep any brood stock anymore. There's different collecting sites around it's Michigan. Like Shock River, whatever, to get the fish and or... Actually, they do some netting. Okay. Room, and I'll tell you how long we keep the eggs and, and things of that nature. We're gonna go up to the front there, so if we can kind of go back around this way, and I'll meet you up by that, that gauge up there. Fish don't need the lights at all. The lights are just here. I talked with the with the crew, they turn them on so you guys can see the fish. Uh, what lights will stop, the fish won't eat while the lights are on because they're not used to it. And also when people come up to the tank they won't eat, so we try to we try to limit that as much as possible. Just because it's a new new thing to them. You can see the tops, so you have jump guards. When they get a little bit bigger, they'll start popping out of the tank. So we have to put those down to try to keep them in. Trout like to jump. What's the we, water is the first thing. We've kind of seen how that works. What's the next thing? Food. Well, food's next. Food's third. Oxygen. In each one of these tanks, you'll see a little wire going in. The first two. That's right here. On the end of that wire is a little round oxygen membrane. It's a, it's a probe. It measures the oxygen content. We can check. How much is going in? We got 18 parts, 18.7 parts per million, and 15 parts per million going out. That way we know how much oxygen the fish are using. If we need more oxygen, we can pump it into the tank. We try to keep it at least 12 going in and 6 going out. Anything below 8, the fish start having trouble. So we try to keep it up, up at that. Right now we're doing fine, but when the fish get bigger, they're going to use more oxygen. So then we have to keep a close watch on that. And the second use, we have to keep a close watch on that to make sure there's enough going in. There's a fish count. We'll keep the fish in uh, the, the frying here until they're four inches. At that point, they become fingerlings. They'll come up, they'll go outside. What we do is at that point, we count the fish and we also tag the fish. We'll get a crew in here. Take the fish, they'll put them into an anesthetic, they kind of drug them so they're not flopping around. They'll go through an assembly line where somebody will take them out, clip the, clip the uh, right pectoral fin, and then they'll put them in this trough. They'll go through the counter, they'll get counted by this machine, and they're going to out to the brake plate. We clip the uh, pectoral fin so we know it's a hatchery fish. So anytime you catch one, 
out, out there, if you're catching trout, it's got the right pectoral fin to it, it's a hatchery raised fish. When we collect eggs to, to raise fish, we try to collect wild stock, something that's reproducing on its own. So we won't, we won't take eggs from the hatchery raised fish. Will they go back? They won't go back. We also put a tag in about 220,000 fish. It's uh, right here's a tag. We put it right in the snout of the fish. And if you look real close, you can see an actual tag right there. Right there in the snout. Wow. If you find one with the adipose fin clipped, you need to get, bring the head of the fish back into the DNR. Either you can bring them here or you can bring them to the in our original office. That little little tag right there tells us everything we need to know about the, about the fish. Where it was raised, uh, where it was released, how old it is, everything like that. So once we find out where it's caught, we can figure out where it went after it left the hatchery. Um, we get a lot of information back from you. Can we get a prize? I don't think, I don't think Michigan's giving anything away. <laughs> we do two types of species. We do Cold water species, which are the trout and salmon, and the cool water species, which are northern pike, muscalunge, and walleye. The cold water are done in the trays. There's a screen in there, the eggs are put between the screens, and water is flowed through them. Uh, it keep, kind of keeps the eggs a little separated in one layer. That way, we reduce fungus on the eggs. Also, to aid in uh, the reduction of fungus, we use hydrogen peroxide. We used to use formaldehyde, but some of you may know that can cause cancer, so we quit using that. We're trying to get this a little user-friendly. The trout spend about one month in their hatching. They'll hatch. It takes about a week, a week and a half to get the eyes, and then they start to develop. We keep them in there until they absorb the egg sac, and then they'll be transferred out here. Uh, once they absorb the egg sac, we have about five days to get them to eat. If they don't eat within that five days or learn to eat within that five days, they'll die. They'll never learn to eat. So we have to keep food in front of them all the time once they absorb their egg sac. With the, with the cool water, they'll be in here a week to ten days. We, uh, we have two systems. We have one that just keeps them hatching at a normal rate. And when we want them to hatch, when we want a group to hatch, we'll use this center set, we will heat the water on that, and we can hatch them all within a few hours. Uh, just for, for, for your information, we do about 75 million walleye. So we have a lot of them going through here. Uh, we don't raise them all up to two inches. We release walleye at two inches, because after two inches, they start to eat each other. So we try to get rid of them at that point. We will dispense fry all over the state. Uh, once they hatch out, and, you know, the people are waiting for it. A two-inch fish, you know, two inch fish. Uh, You'd be surprised. Right now, we over in a health lab, we have some musky. And they're, last time I seen them, they're about two inches. Once they get a quarter of an inch bigger than another one, they will eat it. <laughs> they're that predatory. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's why we keep them over there, because at this stage, it's so intensive. Somebody is constantly going through, and wait, this one's a little bit too big, put it with another don't, don't they swallow it? They swallow it and they'll just keep it in their mouth until they digest it. Oh, so it just kind of goes through. Oh, I wonder how You know, I don't have a figure on that. It depends on what size. We raise them to two inches and then we'll, we'll dispense them. Uh, there's other fish hatcheries that we give them to that will raise them up to eight inches. So. The figures on that, I, I, I'm not sure of. I know if we release in the, in the spring at two inches, the fish will grow eight inches that year. So, so by the next time, they're already eight inches. No, we, the state has certain areas they release in. The other people, like, like Gun Lake, I know we give them fry and they raise them up. So they just raise in Gun Lake and we won't release them. No difference from eight inches to bigger on on survival rate. Now the walleye fry there's probably uh, a good deal of predation. What we're going to do is we're going to head on out to the to the back door there and go through the food room. So kind of head that way. Use that to keep the water flowing. Are we well? It's going up there. 
This is the food room in the storage area. Um, what we have are, we use pellet food. We use entirely pellet food. They'll start off back here with the number three starter, which is about point in millimeters. We'll go on up to a four millimeter food. That's the biggest we use, which is the bottom one right there. Same thing that's out in the, the feeders out, out by the pond. Right now, these fish are at one millimeter. Uh, they just switched over. The, the food is a 50% protein. It's primarily made out of crushed up fish and feathers. So that's what we feed them, fish and feathers. So they always eat other fish. They always eat other fish. <laughs> Most of these are floating pellets or they'll, they'll hit the water. These fish get trained that anything hits the water is a grab. So it's kind of fly fishermen love that because uh, as some of you, if you stay here till 2 o'clock, we'll do a little fishing on the pond. You'll, you'll see when the hook hits the water, they'll grab it. If they don't grab it, then you won't get a bite. They won't touch it when it's hanging in the water. We use about 1,500 pounds a day when we're under full production. We'll use 1,200 pounds out of the and 300 inside. So right now we're probably using about 300 pounds a day of food to feed these fish. They'll spend four months in here. They gain about an inch in length a month. So that's pretty good production. Once they get outside, they'll increase their body weight 600% while they're out outside. So they'll get six times bigger. When are you in uh, full production, like in the winter? Full production, if you come in the spring, early spring, from March to, to April to early May, everything will be running. We'll have fish in the incubation room, there'll be fish here, there'll be fish out there. Uh, the only fish you ever see in the raceways are the steelhead. When they, when they go out, then we start bringing the Chinook salmon in, and we'll raise those to about four inches, and then we'll plant them the same, pretty much the same time as the steelhead. This, but every time I do, somebody notices the feathers and they're like, why do you have all of those feathers in there? Well, we actually use these in the hatchery and we've got a supply of about 60 geese out here. They keep dropping these feathers for us, so it works out pretty good. What do you think we use them for? Feed. Well, that's a good answer since I told you this, but not quite. What's that? Fountain pen. Fountain pen? That would be nice. What? To clean. I think you said it too. We use this to clean the tank. Nobody told me to tickle the fish. No, huh? I don't. <laughs> um, we use them to clean. What we'll do is we'll get two feathers from the, the same wing. And how you tell that is you take it, you look at the curve. The curve side goes down. And then the fat part of the wing goes towards the back. So this comes from the right wing of a goose. We'll find two of those. We'll put them together on a stick. And we'll use that to sweep the food out and clean that, clean the cracks up. Now why do we use this instead of a brush? Because brushes might scratch. They might, well, they might scratch the fish, and these won't scratch anybody. <laughs> and they probably could do that too. But they're real soft on the fish. They don't hurt the fish, and it doesn't hurt the water. To keep the disease out, we do dry them out for a period to make sure there's nothing living in them. Against the wall. You guys can actually smell stuff in there, and I can't smell it anymore. <laughs> I'm immune. <laughs> I was telling somebody I can't smell it anymore. I've been here too long. About 1%, well, even less than 1%, maybe one-tenth of 1% of the fish end up with deformities. For a while, sometimes I have a two-headed fish if they find one for me. Um, a two-headed? And I'll show you one when we get up to the get up to the hat, back up to the interpret center. Uh, one, one tenth of one percent, that's not too bad. So far this uh, this group, they've only found two fish that had deformity. So that's a, that's will they a live long or not? A two-headed fish in the wild would probably get eaten or not eat, not have any food. If for some chance one head took over and one died and they did live, the other head gets absorbed into their body. Wow. So then they would live, but uh, uh, they don't live very long. These were so small, they, they weren't growing at all. They weren't getting any food. From there, they come out here. They're piped out into here. We have a full system like we do in there. The water comes through there. It'll come through this swirly pipe that breaks up the water. 
we can there's a black tube on the back that injects oxygen back into the water we only do that if it's needed usually by the second or third one that's where we use it until we're maybe in April the last of April just before we release you might have we might have to put some out here same system we got the baffles put the flow down to the bottom if you look down the center there's a big tube that's our automatic fish feeder out here there's usually a big white box there but it's tore apart right now there's a cone system it twirls the food around it drops down into the pipe it's pneumatically driven the air blows the food down the pipe the pipes open up at every section and, and at an interval and it drops the food in if all the fish are down there and none are up here we can shut off these pipes and only feed where the fish are at that way we don't uh, waste a lot of food when you're feeding 1500 pounds you try to conserve where you can yeah. <laughs> um, why is it covered it's a good question up until two years ago the raceway wasn't covered uh, since we've covered it we've been disease free the reason uh, we try to keep out the great blue heron we used to like to come and fish here we try to keep that one, that out and also when you scare them away they would poop in the water and that's how the disease would get put into the water so we keep keep the predators out we also uh, before they had this up there was a family of raccoons living in one of the feeders you know, it was a pretty good deal for them they could go out and get some fish some water go back in their house and and uh, they were pretty happy but we've we've cut that down now the only problem we have is we have sparrows that like to uh, destroy the roof but uh, uh, that's a lesser of a problem than, than, than uh, losing all the fish reverse with fish to transfer disease from one to the other so we'll keep the geese out uh, byproduct of, of the idea is if you think about trout, they don't sit in a warm part of the stream without any cover. They sit in the shade or the deep water. This way, they're more comfortable. Since we put it up, uh, we've had to use a lot less food. They, they eat a whole lot better. They grow a lot better. And towards the end, we have to slow down their production. I think this year they planted some that were, were about 12 inches. And we try to keep them between 8 and 10. We try to plant fish that aren't legal. Um, so if they get used to the, they'll start smolting, and we need them to get used to the stream at the right time. Um, so they even quit feeding one raceway, and the fish still grew. So whatever they did with this, it's been working very well for them. From here, they'll go into the trucks. They get piped into the trucks, and uh, we have uh, three different sized trucks we use. We actually don't use that small one very much. We have a big semi that comes in that'll carry about 25,000 fish. Wow. This one will somewhere between 10 and 20,000 fish, depending on the side, and the smaller one probably around 10,000 fish. It's a fully contained unit. We have water on there that circulates. There's air in there. Each of the sections is either a separate tank or it has the baffles in there. And we do that so that when you stop the truck, the water doesn't push you another 20 feet forward. So we've eliminated that problem. Um, these trucks will go all over the state. The, the state has gotten wise. If they go to the UP, they now have two sets of drivers. One will drive halfway, and then they'll take them. Otherwise, people are on the road 17 hours, and that's, that's not quite good for them. So. Do they feed the fish in the trucks? They won't feed the fish while they're in the truck. Oh, the car service. Any other questions? How do you, um, how do the animals get in? Well, it used to be this used to, didn't wasn't here at all, so they could just walk up to the tank. She threw three sets of raceways and then out to that first pond. Now it's rich in urea and stuff, right? Right. So and that's why we, we kind of filter it out in that pond and we dredge that pond and, and keep it out there. Okay. And we have a second pond that goes to that gets anything that didn't get caught there, mm -hmm. and then it goes back out to the second pond. pond also. We don't have to do that as often. Uh, Something popped in my mind and it's going to get uh, If you haven't been through, we have the exhibit room. The watermelons are here, so if you want a watermelon, you can pick one up at the back. Um, there's a fly fisherman up there. He'll teach you all you want to know about fly fishing. And, and we have some people from the Isaac Walton League that will they'll talk to you there, too, in a few exhibits. So enjoy yourself. If you didn't get to see the slideshow, I'll, I'll start that up for you in a few minutes. Hey! I had that one. Yeah, you did. Who wants to try it? You want to try it? Yeah.
stone. Now, what you do? You see it? You see the red thing at the end of this? Yeah. All right. See it down there? I gotta get. I gotta get a. I'll throw it out there, and then you, then you do this. Watch, watch me. You gotta, watch him. You gotta twitch it. See, because they hit some. It's gotta be moving for it to get their attention. Gotta be moving. Okay, here. Twitch it now. Just twitch it. it. He's gonna back here. Let me twitch. I like this. Twitch it. A little twitch it. Yeah. Put it out there again. I'll get it out there again. There you go. Now twitch it. Twitch it. You gotta drag it. There you go. No, Kyle, just let it go. One, one hit it. One hit it. There, that one hit it, see? There's no hook on it, Kyle, so you gotta... No hook on it. He just, he just wants to show you how to do it. You just keep dragging this up, like that, until you get it out of the Have your dad get Let's see what I got. Let's see. Oh, right there he is. Now you just, just get, just whip it. No, no whip it. No? Get, you go back and forth? No, you go back. It's gotta be flat. The idea, the oh, idea yeah. of, of, of fly fishing is... One. Yeah. Well, I just... I can do this because I've been doing this for right. But the, the cast is to load up. In other words, this line has to be should be straight out before I pull, pull it back, like okay. this. Okay. See? Oh, okay. Well, you're going on an angle like this. Well, it's not, it's not like this. Oh, see? Yeah, <laughs> oh, he's, he's yeah they get on. They get oh, on yeah. for a second. Then you just keep it down here. Let it go back, right? Oh, not bad. Keep it up. Too fast. Too fast? A little slower? See? Oh, yeah. Pretty cool. You want to try it? You want to try it, Aaron? Here, Aaron, let me put it out there. Right. Aaron, I'm going to put Is it Aaron? Aaron. Let me put it out this way. There you go. Let's get a little cool. Here, see, here, all right. You have two already. <laughs> They're so light. That's so quick. Yeah. Let it get out to behind you. Let that line get out Not too much. Not just gentle. Yeah. It's a gentle sport. Yeah. Dad, over here! There! See, see? There you go. It's a giant thing. There. You're not going to catch you, you, like, you, you, you catch them if they had hooks on You had his mouth too, didn't you? Yeah. I see it. There's a fish right down here with a hook in his mouth. But you got some oh, fish food there. Oh, yeah. Oh, do they like that? <laughs> you got that. Wow. Boy, at least you're right. They grab and they won't let go for it. Put these in or they come right out to that Yeah, the, this is the display room here. Yeah, in, in the first part we have we have the four different uh, type of environments that you're going to find fish in. Uh -huh. uh, inland lakes, Great Lakes. Uh, now this is, this is inland fishing. lakes here. Okay, that's a nice display, wow. Now what are these, these are just to show the environment that the fish... Yeah, kind of what kind of fish you'll find there. Um, what the environment looks like. Uh huh. And most of them have fishing and fishing into it, so you can see. Okay. Cold water streams. Okay. Now oh, those are nice displays. It's a little dark in here, but uh, this shows the Great Lakes. Okay. Most of them are designed a little bit dark so you can get the natural, mm -hmm. natural effect. So it tries to give, give an idea of the, the environment that those fish are in. Yeah, okay. This is trout streams, okay. Oh, very nice. 
this display down here in the... That's part of the, uh, the Michigan fisheries cycle. It starts off with Native Americans with the dead off the air. Goes on through to commercial fishermen mm -hmm. and on to what uh, the hatchery does. Oh, okay. And also along here we have... Tells you how fish can see, breathe, and the anatomy of the fish. Gives you a little information. We have information on the Great Lakes. Birth of a fish. And this, oh, I see, anatomy of the Great Lakes. The structure, basically, right? Aha, uh -huh, that would be real interesting <laughs> for a structure fisherman standpoint. Okay, those are nicely done, too all the different lakes and this is a display of uh, fishing early early fishing we have an early american fishing uh, goes on through the commercial fishermen mm -hmm. and uh, kind of gives you a history slideshow program oh yeah okay history of fishing in michigan very nice some of the equipment that they use Fishery division, fishery fisheries division. Fisheries division. Or how it started, some of the old the, uh, equipment they used. Oh, yeah. Now, what's this down here, this red? This is a the red thing is a fish food grinder. When they used to oh. grind their own food. We have an egg collecting station, uh, a fish grater where you put the fish through and search them by size. Oh, yeah, okay. The, the, with the uh, bars across it there, down here. No, I don't know. It's just a, it's a boat. It's a boat that they <laughs> probably that the fishermen, the yeah, early yeah, fisheries yeah. people used. Yeah. And we these are some of the nets. nets we use okay. For, uh, yeah. in the hatchery. So this is the mount room here, yeah. where you have all the mounts. Oh, you didn't have the are these the, the minnows and? We have some of the minnows. We don't have everything up there, but. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, pretty close. Larger, because there's a lot of species of them. I'm sure lampreys. And uh, so they, you have them in different the groups of the sunfish group. Sunfish. Now the largemouth bass is in the sunfish group, right? Well, in I think it's one. in the sunfish family. Okay. Herring, um, bowfin. Perch are the yellow perch, the sauger, and the walleye, and the white fish. That's a nice mouse. These are the big ones. And we have the salmon. Wow, Chinook salmon, coho, pink salmon. Michigan, does Michigan have pink salmon? We actually have a natural population in oh. uh, Lake Superior. What happened was a, a hatchery flooded in Canada. Uh -huh. and a bunch of fish got washed up into the, to the lake and now there's a natural population. Oh my gosh, sturgeon. Is there still quite a population of sturgeon in certain areas? They're threatened in Michigan, but certain rivers have a, have a good population. Okay. Then the muskies is the northern pike, northern muskie, tiger muskie, and the Great Lakes muskie. So. What we produce is the Great Lakes. Okay. Uh, or, yeah, I think we can reproduce. That's the natural muskie that was in Michigan. The northern is natural. Mm hmm. But Northern musky. The, the males have such a low sperm count that uh, huh. uh, we can't produce them in a the hatchery. Oh, okay. It's real difficult. They have to catch a lot of males to fertilize the eggs. Now, are there eels in Michigan? There's the American eel. I didn't know that. Huh. Codfish. Is that natural in Michigan? I would think that's a. a Introduction. Introduction. Okay, a bourbon. Okay, a bourbon. Yeah, I guess I have seen some of those. Suckers, minnow. Those are drums. White is white bass an introduction? You know, I think it I think it is. I don't okay. think it's natural until the St. Lawrence was opened up. Grailing is natural. Drum, I know I know about those. <laughs> and you know that there, there are no native trout to Michigan? Is that right? The, the native species of the lake and the, uh, the brook trout are actually chars. The only trout species we have are the brown trout. And they're that's true the trout. German brown. Yeah. Ah. And they're, they're, they were introduced. What is the moon eye? Um, my understanding is kind of closely related to the whitefish family. Okay. Um, it's in the Great Lakes? It's in the Great Lakes. It's a deep water fish. I, I, 
don't know of anybody. Okay. That I've never caught one. This is the fishing collection with uh, lures and equipment from way back. Wow. Look at some of those old lures. From 1880s up to about 1950. Ah, some interesting lures. Yes. Okay. Trout fishermen. Look at some of those reels. <laughs> oh, look at the rods. Those, some of those are really ancient. That is interesting. That's nice. It's nice uh, museum. You don't see that kind of equipment. And this is uh, some ice fishing. Ice uh, fishing. Yeah, we got decoys, spears, augers. Uh, actually, have a trot line. I don't know. If they aren't allowed in Michigan now, are they? I don't think so. <laughs> I know they are down south, but I think it's best not to have them. Line dryers. Uh, oh yeah. Old minnow buckets. Wow. I'm leaving. All right. Where the funding from for the for the hatchery? For the hatchery. And, and okay. Wildlife invaders. Now, yeah. basically, the 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 uh, zebra mussel. Zebra mussel, that's a, that's a big problem. Also, the rough is coming in Ruffy, yeah. and competing with the perch. Ah. Uh, we have raw nose goby, tube nose goby, they're both introductions. We have a, a spiny water flea that competes with our, how uh, competes our, our Michigan water flea. Hmm. Um, and then there's plants, so purple loose stripe and Eurasian water oh, yeah. well. I've heard of that. What's the, what's the one that's caused the most damage? That Probably the zebra mussel? Right now, probably the biggest problem is zebra mussel. I think over history it would be the sea lamprey. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Aging fish, basically you work with the scale rings? Yeah, it's much like a tree. They have rings, you can uh, grow each year. Okay. Uh, you know, it works up to a certain age. Um, you can tell if it was a good year, bad year, pretty much the same as, as tree rings. Okay. Yeah. Oh, let's show, let's show this on the video. Okay. You what? You look like the same species to me. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay. The bigger the fish, the bigger the... Display by a taxidermist? This is by Randall Taxidermy. He does a lot of our uh, work on our, our uh, fish here. Oh, I see. Uh, this is kind of... Uh, this display here shows the history of taxidermy. It goes from the old days when they used... Uh, Straw oh, to the yeah. modern, modern forms here. Hmm. Um, a lot of times, I think we forget in the fishing or in hunting hobby, there is other aspects to it, like uh, showing off what you've caught when you catch a record fish. And yeah. There's competitions for doing the, you know, being the most creative taxidermist, doing the mm -hmm. best, uh, yeah. realistic looking displays. That's nice. What what is this display here? This is a, a fly tying display. Um, Another part of the hobby with fly fishermen is making your own yeah. lures mm -hmm. and uh, uh, catching fish with them. Oh yeah, look at some of those flies. It's very interesting because you have to know what's hatching, like what the fish yeah. are going to bite and how to make that look uh, look like that uh, critter. Some very interesting equipment. Feathers, they got all the feathers there. And These feathers and fur and a little bit of everything. Some really detailed uh, flies, too. Very much works of art. Okay. And what you got over against the wall over here? Over the, against there, we're having a watermelon giveaway. Ah, I see some of them are already gone. Most of them. Looks like half of them are <laughs> gone already. <laughs> here today so I'm gonna need all your cooperation uh, we're gonna have to share poles a little bit so if you're here with a family we'll try to give you one pole for family everybody will be allowed to catch one fish and then you give up your pole to somebody else uh, this is a catch and release program so you're gonna catch it and we're gonna put it back into the water uh, any family members that want to help we we'll probably can use that to, to help control the crowd. There'll be no fishing from the dock. We'll fish from shore, that way nobody will get hooked or you won't uh, 
uh, actually hurt the fish when you bring them up on the dock. So we'll be fishing from shore. You will get to keep the bobber. So if you're going to be in the program, what I want you to do is before we go down, I'll tell you to come up and get a bobber. You'll get one out of that box, and then you'll take it down there to a pole. And you'll use it on the pole. Tara and I are going to be doing the instructions. I'm going to first show you how to cast, and then we have four poles. We'll have four people practice a little bit, and once we think that you're, you're able to relatively where you want to hit, then we'll let you go down to the pond and catch some fish. You are in charge of putting on your own worm. <laughs> so, <laughs> we will help you a little bit, and we'll try to help you release. With the trout, they're a little sensitive when they come out of water. So when you put them back, you have to pump them a little bit and get the oxygen going again. And uh, I'll be there with the first fish and kind of show you how that's done. And, and we, we fished last weekend, and we didn't lose any fish. Lost a couple of hooks out there, but other than that, we the, the trout are doing fine. So we have to work yeah, with them a little bit. Right. I'm going to go right out here and kind of show you how it's done. The regular close face spin casting rod. To get the line out, you press the button, and then you'll just flip it and let go of the button beforehand. You'll bring it back, press the button, and let it go. After you've done it a couple of times, you'll probably get pretty accurate. The wind's going to throw you off a little bit, but you'll get pretty accurate. You do that? If you notice, when I bring it back, I'm always watching where the hook is. You need to be aware of everything around you because there may be, may be people watching you. Your mom and dad may be behind you. You don't want to put a hook in their ear. What I found is they'll hit right when they right when it gets to the water. It's going to take a little bit of fighting. Don't get them. Um, do you think they melt? Do you have all the Yeah, we've got some there. Stone. It'll take a little bit of... Yep, they get away sometimes. Where's the bobber? 
bobbers are in that box on the other side of the... Uh, okay, you get the bobber, Alex. Right over here, bud. In that box, right over there. Upside down. <laughs> and how about how about some bait? You want to put the bait on the hook? You don't want to put the bait on the hook? Why not? Got a huge one on. I could get a huge one on right there. Oh, there's one oh, there. Yes,